what the book, the book of Judges shows two, at the end of the book of Judges, it says there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. This has both a positive meaning and a negative meaning. Negatively, it means that, that people were abandoning the covenant that God had made with Israel at Sinai and uh, abandoning the reaffirmation of the covenant in Deuteronomy. But there's a positive meaning to it, and that is that Yahweh was able to maintain the covenant by himself uh, in spite of the people. Then when, when we come to the book of Samuel, we see uh, that Samuel is a, is a transitional figure. He's the last of the judges, and he's the beginning of the prophets. And we see that under Samuel, we have the installation of kingship, which is something that God had planned for from the beginning. Uh, we'll, uh, hopefully, we'll have a chance to... Uh, it, it, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Uh, Yahweh actually planned for kingship right from the start. And he, he planned that he would raise up from from the Israelites, from their brothers, someone to be a king over them. And there were three negative things, three negative commands, and three positive commands. The negative commands are not to multiply wives, not to multiply gold, and not to multiply horses. The reason for these things all have to do with putting your trust in Yahweh. What happens when you... Well, first of all, who does a king marry? Yes. And where are you going to find royalty? Other nations. So the danger in multiplying wives is to create alliances, political alliances with other countries and then rely on those political alliances in times of trouble rather than relying upon Yahweh. Multiplying horses... Horses pull chariots. And uh, you should go online. There are some very interesting videos on the Internet uh, where, they've act, where archaeologists and engineers and a team of people have actually reconstructed uh, Egyptian chariots and Hittite chariots. Hitt Egyptian chariots had, uh, were two-man chariots and Hittite chariots were three-man chariots. And uh, if you... I'm just, it, 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 this was an unbelievable art, uh, engineering feat. Uh, the BBC, I think, has one of these. Uh, uh, and um, if you had a bunch of ch chariots coming like this uh, against the enemy and turning around, and as they turn around, the guy gets a couple of shots off, if you had a row of those chariots it would be very close to 6,000 rounds per minute like our, big, uh, like our helicopters in the Marines. Okay? So we think we're really something. But uh, this was pretty, pretty advanced technology. Okay? So these are the t tanks of the, of the ancient warfare, the Panzer divisions. All right? So, in other words, God is saying, don't put your trust in military hardware. And then gold, because... Uh, well, <clears throat> what can you do with gold? You can buy help. Like, uh, remember when uh, Merodach Baladan, the king of the Babylonians, sent messengers to Hezekiah. He showed him everything he had. Why? He's saying, I can pay you to fight off the Assyrians. So he's not putting his trust in Yahweh. He's putting his trust in himself. And that's why that even though chronologically that comes before chapters, the events of chapters 36 and 37, Isaiah places that after because he doesn't want, he's got, he wants you to look into the future for a coming king who's not only way better than bad King Ahaz, but he's way better than good King Hezekiah. There's a king that's coming. Uh, Chapter 11, right? A shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse. Why doesn't he say a, a shoot will come from the stump of David? Okay. 
the Davidic tree that's cut down? Why doesn't he say a shoot will come from the stump of David? Why does he say a shoot will come from the stump of Jesse? Well, what he's really saying is, we don't need another David, we need a new David. David came from Jesse. We need a brand new David. And so it's his way of of saying the Messiah is not just another person in the Davidic line. He's a brand new David. So we come to 2 Samuel chapter 7 where God makes a covenant with David. And by the way, every biblical scholar, every, every conservative or evangelical biblical scholar agrees that God makes a covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7, but the word covenant isn't in the chapter. So why do we need covenant in Genesis 1 in order to believe that there's a covenant there? All right, 2 Samuel chapter 7. You've got an outline. We're going to spend, we're going to spend some time. Let's see. We, yeah, we're going to spend some time looking at this verse by verse. Uh, who gave out the handouts? Are there any extras? Uh, I can get a couple of extras. Oh, you, what do I think? Abraham. Oh, yeah. Can I can I just look at one? So can someone look uh, here? You could look you could look with your wife, uh, and I'll give it back to you. Okay, remind me. So this chapter, we're going to actually read it because it's very important for you to believe what God's Word says and not believe what Gentry says, okay? Uh, What's this? uh, It is called a covenant in other places in the Bible. Uh, What's this say? Uh, Okay. Let's look at this together. I would uh, would divide it into two two parts. The first part is God's promise to David, and the second part is David's prayer to God. Let's look at, uh, just to prove that, let's look at verse 18. Let's look at verse 18. After God makes these promises to David, in verse 18 it says, And the king, David, came and sat before Yahweh. What does that mean? How, would, how, would, how do you go and sit in front of Yahweh? You go to the temple, exactly. Hmm? Look, uh, there was a tabernacle. Yeah. And the, you know what? There's another thing. The, the liberal scholars say the Psalms couldn't have been written by David because they talk about the temple, and, and the temple wasn't built until Solomon was king, Right? But all you have to do is go back to 1 Samuel chapter 1 where we have the story of Hannah and Peninnah who go to the temple, who go to the house of Yahweh. So you have both expressions for the temple used twice in that chapter. So you don't have to have Solomon's temple to go to the temple. It's an institution, not a building. Okay? The liberals need to wake up, you know, and read the text here. They just come from an, a, a bygone era where they exalt human reason over everything. Maybe they think they have all the answers. We need to humble ourselves and let, you know, uh, let the Bible examine us. David came and sat before the Lord. So that means he's in the temple. And that's why, and what we see here is a prayer to God. We see David's praise and worship, and we see his requests. So uh, you can see why I divide the text into two parts. Let's look at the first part, verses 1 to 17. When the king sat in his house, or dwelt in his house, and Yahweh had given to him rest, let's see, had given rest to him from on all sides, from all his enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, 
I am dwelling in a house of cedar, that is cedar paneling, but the ark of God is dwelling between the curtains. So, there's a real, David sees a problem here. He's in a house of real wood and God's still dwelling in a Bedouin tent. You know what they look like. I don't see the tabernacle as too much different in some ways. <clears throat> so, uh, what we see here in verses 1, uh, and, and so Nathan said to the king, all that is in your heart, go do for Yahweh is with you. So we see uh, David has a plan. And so I wrote down, David proposes to build a house for Yahweh. Okay? Do you see that in the text? Okay, let's go to the next part. We see God's promise. That night, that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, How does God communicate to prophets? How does God communicate to prophets? In dreams and visions. Now, if you need to see that, go to verse 17 where it says, according to, all the, according to all these words and according to this vision, thus Nathan spoke to David. So, he had a vision at night. This is exactly according to the Bible because uh, when Moses was getting ready to die, he said, you know, Mo- God spoke to Moses face to face, but how are you going to know God's will when Moses dies? Who's going to come along? And do Moses' job. Well, there's not going to be a person who will speak. Yahweh isn't going to speak with somebody face to face. But he's going to speak to prophets through dreams and visions. And in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, he shows that there are wrong ways to know the will of God. Going to the necromancers and the mediums. Um, You can imagine how this rose, right? Uh, so you're living a life and uh, your parents die when you're 30, right? And you don't know what to do, so you say, I, you know, I'd really like to consult my dad and mom. Is there somebody that can help me consult my dad and mom? I'd like to figure out what I'm supposed to do in this mess. And so uh, somebody says, yeah, I can help you do that. And, uh, and uh, you know how it's done? It's done by two means. Number one, it's done by trickery. So, uh, for example... In the, a lot of the words for these kind of people are ventriloquists because they, it's not, it's not throwing your voice to a puppet. It's making it sound like this is your dad and mom speaking instead of them speaking, you see. And the other part is by demonic spiritual powers. And if you've been, a, and, uh, you know, uh, my my parents were missionaries in the Philippine Islands, so we, I experienced this very young. I mean, there was a guy that had uh, 99 demons in him, and it took, 100, it took a, an all-night prayer meeting to get them out. And it took eight men to hold him down while they were coming out. We had a guy visit our church in the 70s. He was a missionary to India. And uh, so somebody said to him, do you have much exposure to to uh, demonic spiritual powers. He says, yes, every time I go into a video store. (laughs) So that was his comment. Anyway. Uh, The, uh, so, uh, so we have uh, uh, God speak to Nathan through a vision and we have God's promise to David and there are two parts to it. Uh, The first part is, will you build a house for me? You can see that in verse 4. Verse 5, go say to my servant, to my servant. I just want to stop here for a second. That should hit you between the eyes. Did you know that, that that's the highest title a human being can be given in the Old Testament? To be called the servant of Yahweh. Here's a sermon for you, Mike. Joshua 1, verse 1. Moses 
the servant of Yahweh is after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh. Then it talks about Joshua, the minister of Moses, right? And at the end of the book, he's called the servant of Yahweh. So there's a sermon right there. How you get from being, you know, an aide. What, what do they call those people in Washington? Uh, like Monica was? Uh, an, an, intern. I'm, an intern. He was Moses' intern. How do you, how you get from being an intern to the servant of Yahweh? That's the book of Joshua right there. Okay. Very few people get this title in the Old Testament. So, I want that to hit you between the eyes with a big hammer. Go, say to my servant, to David, Thus says Yahweh, Are you the one to build a house for me? Or... Uh, I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the sons of Israel from Egypt, sorry, from Egypt unto this day. And I was walking back and forth in a tent and in a tent. Two different words for tent. <clears throat> and wherever I walked back and forth among the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why did you not build for me a house of cedar? So we see uh, in verses 1 to 7 that God says, No, you're not going to build a house for me. I never asked this of you. Okay? Then we see a new section. How do I know this is a new section? Notice in verse 8 what we call the messenger formula. And now th thus you shall say to my servant to David. Do you see that? Prophets are messengers. They bring a message from Yahweh to the people and they always start by saying, thus says the Lord. Do you see that? And so uh, we call this, uh, Old Testament scholars call this messenger, a messenger formula and it's very often uh, a marker of a new paragraph. So that's how I know this is a new paragraph. And, and now, thus you shall say to my servant to David, thus says Yahweh of armies. There it is. I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for someone else. I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Okay? Thus says Yahweh of armies, I took you from the sheep pen, from following the sheep, to be a leader over my people, over Israel. And I was with you wherever you went, and I cut off all your enemies from before you. Now notice what happens. Right in the middle of this verse, he switches from past tenses to future tenses. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great people who are in the earth. And I will, place, I will make a place for my people, for Israel. And I will, and I will plant him or them, and he will dwell in his place, and no one will, uh, no one will uh, agitate him or move him any longer or trouble him any longer, and the violent men will no longer oppress him as they did at the beginning. So we see that uh, right in the middle of the verse, uh, it switches from past tenses to future tenses. And there are three promises. There are three promises. What are those three promises? I will make for you a great name. I will make a place for Israel, for my people Israel. And uh, victory over your enemies, right? a great name a firm place for Israel and rest for David from his enemies so those are the three promises now look in verse 11 and from today 
And from the day which I command the judges over my people Israel, uh, that actually belongs to the previous verse. So the verse division is rather bad there. So no longer will violent men oppress Israel as they did at the beginning and from the day when I commanded judges over my people Israel. So Israel's history starts with the Exodus up to the period of Judges. You see? That's what he's saying. From the day I, from the day I, uh, from the day, from the beginning and from the day I, I commanded Judges. We're just through the period of the Judges, right? So that's the history of Israel. And I will, let's see, where, what, what happens next? And I will give rest to him from all his enemies. Now notice at the end of verse 11, and he, Yahweh will announce to you that he will make, that Yahweh will make a house for you. I want you to notice, I want you to notice that we have a modified version of the messenger formula. And he, Yahweh will announce to you. Do you see that? So that is another messenger formula and it marks a new section. And what happens here is that we move from promises to be fulfilled during David's lifetime to promises that will be fulfilled after David's death. Watch how this works. Yahweh will build a house for you. We're going to come back to that. For when, when your days are full and you lie down with your fathers, what does it mean to lie down with your fathers? To die, it's an expression in the Old Testament, to die. I will raise up your descendants after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So we see very clearly that there's a new messenger formula marking a new paragraph and we're switching from promises that will be experienced by David fulfilled in his own lifetime to promises that will not be fulfilled until after he's dead. And what's going to happen is God will give him a family line. God will give him a, fam a, a, a family line, a kingdom, and a throne. All right? There's a play on words here. And it's very important that you get this because this play on words goes right through the rest of the Old Testament, right into the New Testament. Uh, the word house is being used in two senses. David thinks he's going to build a house for God, and he means a temple. God says, no, you're not going to build a house for me. I'm going to build a house for you, and he means a dynasty. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry, we have to get into monarchy here. And uh, you're, you've got to grasp this or you're not going to understand the text. So uh, the Bible is about monarchy, not republic. Yeah. So what we see is that there are three promises of Yahweh, a descendants, kingdom, and throne, then in verses 14 and 15, there's a description of the covenant relationship. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. So in other words, what, what's the relationship going to be like? It's going to be like a father-son relationship. Okay. When he perverts his way, I will discipline him with the rod of, the, of men and with the strokes of the sons of men. But my chesed, there's a covenant word, my faithful, loyal love, my faithful, loyal love will not depart from him as I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. So the covenant relationship is defined as a father-son relationship. Then what we have is the same three promises are repeated. Did you see that? Verse 16, and your house will be firm... In other words, your family line, your descendants, 
and your kingdom forever before you, your throne will be firm forever. So we have the same three promises. So this is an A-B-A structure. Do you see that? You have the promises of seed, kingdom, throne. Then you have the covenant described as a father-son relationship. What is expected of the son? Obedience. Obedience. Yeah. So when he is disobedient, God is going to chastise him, but he's not going to take away the covenant from him. Okay? And then we have the same three promises. I would like to suggest to you that the literary structure tells us how this covenant is going to work. In the middle, we have a father-son relationship, which means there are obligations expected on the part of the Davidic king. God is looking for an obedient son. Do you see that? However, this relationship is guaranteed on both sides by the mighty promises of Yahweh. So, once again, I would say, we cannot adequately describe this covenant in terms of the words conditional and unconditional. It's guaranteed by the promises of God, but it's not going to happen without an obedient son. All right. I want to uh, let uh, quickly... Um, uh, I'm going to come to, uh, in the last part, in the last part, verses 18 to 29, we see, uh, first of two things, we see David's praise and worship. First of all, his, his wonder, he says, who am I that you should make this kind of a th- arrangement with me? And then he praises God in verses 21 to 24, how Oh, God, you're a great God. You're tremendous. I can't believe you're doing this. And then, he, then we see David's requests. And basically, we have an ABA structure. He asks God to confirm his word. He expressed trust in God's word. And he asks David to bless his house, which is another way of saying, please confirm your word. So it's an ABA structure. Uh, The Hebrews are very clever at saying the same thing in uh, many different ways. Now, I want to briefly talk about um, the father-son relationship and then summarize what's happening here. How are we to understand the father-son relationship? There are four things that we four four things that will help us. We need to understand how the word son is used in Hebrew. I don't know if this is on here. I don't think it is. Secondly, we need to see the cultural context of kingship in Canaan. Thirdly, we need to see the use of familial family language in treaties. And fourthly, we need to see the context in the canon of Scripture. Number one, let's talk about the meaning of the word son. A literal, physical, family relationship is clearly contrary to the context. Nonetheless, the term for son in Hebrew has a much broader field of meaning than the word son in English. Remember that this was a farming economy. All the people were either farmers or shepherds. This is a pre-industrial society. What happens in a pre-industrial society? You don't need guidance counselors. Why? Because you do what your father did. It's very simple. What, your father was a farmer. What are you going to be? A farmer. Your father was a shepherd. What are you going to be? A shepherd. See? could be something spectacular, like your father was a scribe. You're going to be a scribe. Uh, there weren't very many of those. But uh, you did, so not only, not only, see, I, I actually, I actually, uh, my, in my family there's five children. I'm the one who looks the most like my dad. Okay. Not only that, I have all the funny mannerisms that my dad had. So what happened is 
sometime after we were married, we went on a holiday with my parents. And my wife laughed the whole time because everything my dad did, that's what I did, you know. When I go to a part, when I go to the grocery store, you know, I back him. And, and so all the funny little things that I do, they're exactly, I'm a chip off the old block. So number one, I've got his genes. Number two, I've got his mannerisms. And in the pre-industrial pre, uh, society, you also do what your dad did, you see. So the term son in Hebrew can mean possessing the characteristics of. For example, in Isaiah 5 verse 1, the beloved has a vineyard. And here's what the Hebrew text says. On a horn, the son of fatness. What does that mean? Well, a horn means a geographical, feet, a, a geographical formation that looks like a horn. So a mountain ridge or a hillside. And a son of fatness means characterized by fertility. Okay? So that's why your NIV says a fertile hillside. Because... Not too many people, are, English speakers, are going to get a literal translation. Okay? But son can mean possessing the characteristics of. And, we, and we, uh, the, secondly, the ancient Near Eastern and Canaanite cu cultural context is significant. When we were looking at the image of God, people perceived the king as the image of God because he was the son of God. The emphasis was not on physical appearance. For example, a male king could be the image of a female goddess. What is stressed is that the behavior of the king represents the behavior of the god. You see? So when I give my commands, I represent the majesty and power of my deity. Or when I show mercy, then you see that my god is also merciful. You see? And, and if you look at the book, I quote, Quotes from Assyrian and Egyptian literature that show this. From Ugarit, we have the story of King Carrot, who is described as the son of Ale, the son of God, and his excellent health indicates his divine origin. Let's think about this Aramean king of Damascus called Ben-Hadad. Ever heard of him, Ben-Hadad? Hadad is another name for Baal. Did you know that? He's the son of his God. Okay. So, the Canaanite and ancient Near Eastern culture shows that the notion of the king as a son of God was well established. So, we, that's another part of our understanding. The third part of our understanding is when we look at treaties in the ancient Near East, uh, for example, the Hittite treaties, where a great king makes a treaty with a lesser king, the great king would be called the father and the, and the lesser king would be called the son. So family language is used in treaties, okay? That's another indication that we're dealing with a covenant here, even though the word covenant isn't there. By the way, some scholars say that the Davidic covenant is like a royal grant instead of like a suzerain vassal treaty. They're trying to argue that it's an unconditional covenant as opposed to a conditional covenant. But then... Why does it have the language of a suzerain vassal treaty instead of the language of a royal grant? So maybe because those categories aren't going to work for us. And finally, 2 Samuel 7 must be read according to the arrangement of the books in the Hebrew canon. A canonical reading shows that the Davidic king is inheriting the role of both Adam as son of God and Israel as son of God. Remember that Adam was, called, was, was the son of God. Remember that this role was inherited by Israel. Remember when, when Moses was told to go to Pharaoh, he was told to say, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may serve me. Israel is the son of God because she has inherited the role of Adam, of showing the world what it's like to have a right relationship to God and treating humans in a truly, truly human way, social justice. <clears throat> 
So we see uh, the first thing, of course, is that humans are created as the divine image, and the divine image defines human ontology or being in terms of a covenant relationship with the Creator God on the one hand and with the creation on the other. The former may be captured by the term sonship. The latter relationship between humans and creation may be captured by the ideas of servant kingship. In Genesis 2, we see that the Adamic son is like a priest in a garden sanctuary. That's why, why why does Israel build the tabernacle right after the covenant? Because just like Adam is a priest and must get to know God, Israel, as the son of God, must now worship God and spend time in his presence in order to bring God's rule to the people and show the people what God is like. The priority of worship. Israel, then th- we see that Israel inherits this Adamic role. Israel is called the Son of God. And th- thirdly, Deuteronomy 17 intimate, intimates that the king will be the leader in this role. We, I got talking about Deuteronomy 17. We went through the three negative commands. What are the three positive commands? The three, to, write the Torah. to write the Torah. To write the Torah, to, to write out a copy of the Torah, to always read the Torah, and to always have it with him. In other words, there are three ways of saying the same thing. In other words, if this king spends all his time reading the Torah, every decision he makes will be affected by that because it will affect his brain. You see that? That's why Psalm 119 is the psalm of the king. Because the king is totally taken up with the Torah. Psalm 1, you know, blessed is the man, he meditates in the Torah day and night. That's the king. In other words, the king is to be a model citizen. Has it ever really bothered you when you see a policeman going through a stop sign or breaking the law? You know, the people who enforce the law are supposed to be under the law, not over it, right? And so you see, this is the idea in Israel. The king is to be a model citizen. He's to show the other people what it's like to be obedient to the Torah, to follow the instructions. And in in, uh, Isaiah 11, verse 3, it says, The coming king will delight in the fear of Yahweh. And the fear of Yahweh is another name for the Bible. So he will delight in the Torah. He will fulfill the requirements of Deuteronomy 17. We now have to look, uh, we have to look at um, uh, verse 19. Verse 19. 2 Samuel 7, verse 19. We're going to end on time. So in verse 18, he says, Who am I, Lord Yahweh, and who is my house? That is, what is my family that you have brought me to this? Do you remember, do you remember where Dave, Dave, you know, uh, uh, David says, Look, I'm nothing. You know, I don't have the qualifications for this. I don't have the degrees. I don't have the family line. Why are you doing this? And look at this, verse 19. This is a part of the Bible that many scholars have stumbled over. And this was a little thing in your eyes, Lord Yahweh. You spoke also about your, the house of your servant with respect to the distant future. So God has spoken about his family line going into the distant future. And then this last one, this last one, I think it's the ESV that's the only translation I know that has a good translation here. It says, this is the instruction for mankind. Is that what it's? Okay. If you look at all the other Bibles, like the NIV says, is this your usual way of dealing with mankind? Well, why do they have it as a question? 
Why do they have it as a, as a question? Well, uh, questions can be marked in two ways. Questions can be marked by a question marker or they can be marked by intonation. Right, Mike? So I can say Paul went downtown or I can say Paul went downtown. And how are you going to mark that? Okay, we have, we have question markers in the Bible, but we can't identify questions that are there by intonation. You understand that? So they... These scholars understood it as a question because they couldn't make sense out of it as a statement. But the default reading should always be to read it as a statement, you see, unless it has to be read as a question. So first of all, we, we should go with the ESV and read it as a statement because there's no question marker here. Secondly, is this your usual way of dealing with humans? The Hebrew word is Torah. What does Torah normally mean? Instruction. If you get out, your, the diction, if you get out Brown, Driver, and Briggs Dictionary of Hebrew, every occurrence of the word means instruction or law, and then at the very end they say manner, 2 Samuel 7.19. Why should it mean something different in 2 Samuel 7.19 than it means everywhere else in the Bible? That's the cry of despair. That's a lexicographer saying, I give up. I don't know what it means. But we can actually make sense of it. This is the instruction of mankind. Let me tell you what he's saying. If who is David's God? Who is Yahweh? What is the what is the primary thought in Israelite theology? Yahweh is Genesis one. Yahweh is the Creator. Yahweh is the Creator. So let us imagine a meeting between Ben Hadad and David. All right. So. Ben Hadad says, I'm the son of Baal. Better watch out. David says, I'm the son of Yahweh. He's the creator God. You better watch out. My God's bigger than your God. See that? My God is not just a local deity, a tribal deity, the God of some small little square. He's the God of the whole world. You better watch out. You see what that means? In other words, the king is not only going to give instruction... He's not only going to apply the Torah to the nation of Israel, but because his God is the creator God, all the nations are going to have to listen to him. And that's why you get Psalm 2. He's reading 2 Samuel 7.19 the way I'm reading 2 Samuel 7.19. Why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? I've established my king in Zion. I will declare the decree. You are my son. Today have I begotten you. The king is the son of God. So what does he say? Be warned, you kings of the earth. Suck up to this guy. Make your peace right away before it's too late. He will rule the, the nations with a rod of iron. You see? He got it. He got 2 Samuel 7.19. David is the son of God. And his God is bigger than all the other gods in the world. So all the other kings are going to have to suck up to him someday. Well, uh, we're at the end. How is this fulfilled? God actually fuf uh, fulfilled all of these promises. David has a very great name. Uh, it's like the name of the greatest people in the earth. Uh, God did... Uh, uh, give uh, in David's time and in Solomon's time, he gave them the land that is defined by the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. So he made a place for Israel, and he gave him rest from all his enemies. If you read the very next chapter, Second Samuel 8, it's a list of all the kings that he beat down. 
How did God fulfill the last three promises? Well, he filled it in a rather unusual way. Uh, if you're going to have an eternal family with an eternal kingdom and an eternal throne, there are only two ways in which this could work out. It could be that every male king has a son who will be king after him and that that will go into eternity. You see that? Or it could be that one king has a son who will live forever. And that's what happened. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, the family of David. And someone was born who was the Son of God in a way that, that, that blew their minds. He was not only the Son of God in the sense of the true Davidic king, he was physically the Son of God. That's a mind blower, isn't it? In fact, he was the Son of God in the sense of the second person of the Trinity. So there are three senses for the Son of God in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the New Testament. The Son of God as the Davidic king, the Son of God physically uh, generated by God, and the Son of God in the sense of the Trinity. He's the eternal Son, and His kingdom is forever, and His throne is forever. According to the New Testament, when Jesus ascended into heaven, we have the fulfillment of Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until your enemies, until, uh, until you uh, uh, sit at my right hand until, why can't I quote that? I, I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Thank you. I'm getting to the end of my ropes here. Uh, but uh, what's the favorite psalm in America? Psalm 23. What's the favorite psalm of the early church? 110. How do we know that? It's quoted more than any other psalm in the New Testament. See? What they wanted was a king who would beat Nero and all these other people. And uh, so it's fulfilled. It comes to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And uh, the one thing that I want to tell you is that God's plan, since the nation of Israel was failing to keep the covenant. God's plan was for the king, the king to do for the nation what the nation could not do for itself. Now, this is very hard for Americans to understand. You've got to buy into a monarchy. Okay? I'm sorry. If you, I can understand this because I'm a Canadian. The queen, do you know what the queen can say? She can say, I am England. I'm England. Do you get it? I'm England myself. That's why she uses the word we, because she's it. It's called the royal we. You ever heard that? She never says I. She says we. Because she, the king, is, the king of Israel is Israel. We've got to have uh, two more minutes, because I've got to tell you a story. This is a true story. This is October 2003. And I was invited to a conference in Belgium, in Leuven, Belgium, to speak on a very obscure topic, Theodosian. I delight in obscurity. Most of my, most of my writings are unreadable. The first thing that I wrote that was readable was Kingdom Through Covenant, and then they told me that wasn't readable, so we had to abridge it. Well, I, I had never been to Belgium before, and uh, I, was a, I was a little bit worried about how to find my way around, but I had a lot of friends at the University of Leiden in Holland. And so my plan was, I'm going to fly to Amsterdam. It's like a 15-minute ride by train up to Leiden, I'm going to meet up with my friends and they're going to take care of me. They're going to take me down to Belgium and show me how, how, the, how, the, how that part of the world works, okay? If you don't know what to do, ask your friends. So, uh, some of you have gone there. Amsterdam's a beautiful airport. You come in and all you have to do to get on the trains is go to the basement, all right? 
So you come off the plane, you rush downstairs, there's the train to Leiden, I got on it, I'm sitting there quietly like this, twiddling my thumbs, and at the very last minute, an Italian, uh, a, a, Euro, a little European Jew, okay, with his little suitcases, like they looked like they came out of Auschwitz, fat, bald, with his capite, you know, the typical, the typical image, and he comes rushing up, and just as the doors are closing, he pushes his way through, and he collapses in the seat right opposite me. So, after a few minutes, the train takes off, and and he catches his breath, and he starts up a conversation. He says, uh, what are you? And I said, I'm a professor of Tanakh. <laughs> That's the Jewish word for the Bible, okay? Oh, he said, who are your favorite rabbis? And I said, well, you know, to be honest, I don't really read the rabbis very much. So he said, well, then, he said, what's your favorite passage of the Bible? And you know, you know how things are going well, and then you kind of blow it. So I said, I don't really know. I like the whole Bible. He said, I said, what's your passage, favorite passage? So he quoted this verse, and I said, oh, that's Psalm 128 or something like that. And he said, no, you're wrong. It's Psalm, 100, it's Psalm 24. So I whipped my Bible out of my knapsack, and I showed him that I was right. All right. I'm a professor of Tanakh, and I know my stuff. So then I, 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 I said, you know what my favorite verse is? So that's, Psalm, that's Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. So you know what he said to me? He said, I'd like to look at that. So he, he had, I gave him my Bible, and, and, and he started to reading that. And you know what he said to me? Do you know what he said to me? I quote, I quote, these are the exact words, of whom is the prophet speaking? <laughs> End quote. Well, I said, you know, we, we're, we're, we're getting pretty close to Leiden, so I had to wrap this up like I'm trying to do right now. And I said to him, well, you know, obviously, that in the book of Isaiah, there's this person called the servant of, of the Lord. And I said, there's different views on what this servant is, I said the Jewish. There are some people think it's the nation of Israel, and other people think it's an individual. And I said, if you look, you know, I said in a way both are right because in look in 49, in 49, verse 3, he said to me, that is to Israel, you are my servant. So the nation of Israel is the servant. Did you get that? Now, down in verse 5, it says, And now says the Lord, the one who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring back Jacob to himself and Israel to be returned to him. I said, how can the servant be Israel and bring the nation back to Israel? Back to God. So I said, there's a conundrum. There's an enigma. And I said, there's only one way that this can happen if it's the king. The king can say, I am Israel. And what is the king supposed to do? Go out and fight the battles for the people. Right? And save the nation. And so the train was coming into the station, so I had to conclude... And I said, that's why we believe that the servant of Yahweh is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. But that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus said, I am the vine. What does that mean if you know the book of Isaiah? I am Israel. And he met the enemy. The enemy weren't the Romans. The enemy was sin, death, hell, and Satan. He met the enemy on the cross and completely clobbered them. So that's why he's able to bring Jacob back to God and Israel would be gathered. Yep. All right, let's take a break. <laughs>